If I start to falter, do you start praying? <laughs> I must be feeling good. I did a Liverpool accent, and I just did uh, the South. <clears throat> How many ever heard of it, the Issachar? They call it the, it's not in the Bible called that, the Issachar anointing. You've heard that, Issachar anointing? How many heard that? Okay, so I gotta, I'll got i share it, what it means. It's one of the 12 tribes, right? And in, in the prophecy, in, in a prophetic word, in the Bible it said that Issachar, that tribe, would have a unique characteristic amongst the tribes is that they could discern the times, right? So many preachers have made something out of that very honorably and very rightly for many years. This isn't a new idea that I just, you know, got. It's just, a, it's the Holy Spirit. And he wants each of us to have that Issachar anointing, every person, so you can discern the times, so you know what time is it. And you're not relying on uh, what's the latest uh, forecast from the three million and one prophets out there nowadays. There's a lot of them, right? Some are real, some are off, some are very real, some are a little off, some are way off. So it's, so it's like, it's like you, people, I've been meeting people that are going, I am confused. And... Uh, I understand why, you know, I see some of the things and I go, oh boy, and you could just read and hear their stuff all day and really not, at the end of the day, not exactly understand what God's up to. And in fact, in most of them, I don't hear Issachar. Like what, I, what we and people that we fellowship with each other, some of us, what we get when we talk, we, 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 we talk about very similar things on our hearts. Well, why is it that on our hearts, we kind of know, we all have this knowing, some have a detail you don't have, or a little more detail, or like Matthew sharing this morning about the crossing the Jordan. I mean, that's a theme with us. Matthew didn't just, uh, you know, pull that out of the blue that he'd never thought of it before. It's a theme that God's been speaking to his heart for a while, and my heart, and many people's hearts, uh, going back a long time, but it's very intense right now. What's that? So Issachar was one of the 12 tribes, and they said there would be a special blessed anointing on them to discern what's up. Like, what's up in their time? Like, what's up? You don't want to be saying, like, you know, if it's 1856, maybe that's just before the Civil War in the United States, and you're talking about something in the year 1912, and you're actually seeing into the First World War, and you're not fitting it into the time, and you're just messing, messing it up. But you know what? The Issachar anointing is on everybody that has the Holy Spirit. The Issachar anointing. And that's not what I'm preaching on today. Didn't even think of it until now, but just that you know. It's, it's an appetizer. It's like, hey, this gets you ready, because if you have the Holy Spirit, you have the Issachar anointing. You do, right? But that doesn't mean you get it all figured out. But what you need to do, this is what I'm trying to encourage you all to do, is pull aside and turn off, maybe you have to go on a media fast or just cut down. There's, you know, there's a Daniel media fast. That means you don't just shut it all off, but you reduce. I've been finding, because like, we use Telegram a lot. I find it an amazing app to communicate with people that are really close to me and, and dear. And we share the richest things in our hearts. And it just feels like we're talking. It's not like those other awkward apps. And But I, I, I get addicted to it. And I might look at it like, seven times, 10 times a day. What's Matthew saying? Did Matthew say, is Matthew up yet? No, he's not up yet. Did he go to bed yet? You know, has he got anything to say at like 11 o'clock? And I want to say something too. Then and we get going back and forth. And it's all good, really God talk. It's not gossip. It's just, it's not shallow. It's not philosophy and theorizing. We're just on the same page, tracking together, Issachar, Holy Ghost, what's the Lord saying? And he's saying the same thing, but filling in details as we fellowship, right? And it actually says, in Malachi, one of the last prophecies of the Old Testament, it said the Lord was watching, and he's watching, right? And he, he noticed those who feared him on the earth. And he said he noticed that they spoke often to one another. It says that right there. You think it's significant, the last page of the Old Covenant? And, and he was speaking of the end times, a prophecy concerning our times. Right? And there's a whole bunch there in one page. One page. Wow. In fact, you can't get as much out of some entire books of the Bible as you might get out of that last page of the Old Covenant, right? 
And he said, the Lord listened and heard those who were speaking to one another. And why were they speaking to one another? He said, because they feared him. So what do you think the content of their conversation was? Do you think they were Issachar anointing? I think so. They were on the same page. And God actually, they got God's attention. They weren't like gossiping, what's the latest prophecy? And who said what about what? And how many fairies this? And how many that? And rainbows this? And it's just bouncy, fluffy, and then some serious. And oh, the world's going to end tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes and it didn't end. And you know, okay, six days and then an event's going to happen on the East Coast. And you six days go by and six weeks and no event on the East Coast. And you go, well, she said Gabriel appeared to her. And on and on and on and on. And I go, and then, <clears throat> oh, it goes on and on, right? Those who feared the Lord spoke off unto one another. And the Lord listened and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord. And he wrote a book of remembrance. He said, they shall be mine in the day that I make up my treasure, says the Lord. And then you read the next few lines. And it's about the very concerning days we're in. The, the, the dynamics of the end times. The, 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 all the turmoil. But he says, he puts them apart like a treasure. And that's not what we're going to get into today, but there's so much scripture on that. God gathering a people as a treasure, a remnant, where most prophecies you hear today are not about God's treasure. They're about events. But what's God speaking about? What are these people that are fearing the Lord speaking about to one another? End time events? What's the juiciest, the latest? What's the next event that's supposed to happen? Three days of this and seven weeks of that. And they go... Oh, oh, and you're living like, you know, like living on adrenaline, right? And three weeks later, you can't even remember what they said three weeks ago sometimes, you know, unless they, you know, and then the contradictions and, 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 but you will hear from God if you wait on him. And now out of your waiting, you'll have something to share with others who fear him. And you'll be pulled together. It says in Ephesians four, he says the whole body, this is the body of Christ in his ideal. He says the whole body is to be knit together, knit by what every joint supplies. It's not an awkward fit. You feel drawn together because they're hearing from God. You're hearing from God. And when you come together, it's like you, you've, you've been hearing, you, you've been, he's been writing the same book in your heart. And you each come together and you each are a, a line in the page. And you go, and you can actually seamlessly talk. Like Matthew and I, we can seamlessly talk. And we're just totally on the same page. And he'll correct me sometimes, not in doctrine, just in maybe my attitude or whatever too, right? And, and my spirit. And likewise, hey, Matthew, you know. But we're, we're tracking. We fear the Lord. And that's why we treasure even correction that comes through our, the intimacy that God brings us together. You know, 13 times... In the New Testament, it speaks of Jesus having dinner. Like, I'm sure he had dinner every day, you know. So that's, you know, <laughs> you know, with his disciples. Probably had dinner every day with his disciples, three and a half years. But it actually made a point of dressing 13 times. And, and, it, and it also addressed in the, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, how does it talk about the New Testament church? It said they met daily from house to house, breaking bread, which was the fundament of meals, back then, breaking bread and, 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 and sharing in the, in the apostles' doctrine. And they just, they, in other words, they weren't just about, let's just all eat and feast and, you know, it was about the word of God. And it was those who feared the Lord had gathered together in the book of Acts. And they, they were addicted to the gathering together of the saints. And that is the characteristic of these end times. God will be gathering us again very much not necessarily exclusively, but very much in homes. And meals will be a part of it. And you see that. He started it. He started his ministry at a wedding feast, right? And at the last page of the book, there's a wedding feast. And right in the middle where he died to purchase everybody that's going to be there, he has his last supper with his disciples. So dinner means a lot. And you think of the intimacy that Jesus, you see that Jesus had with his disciples. At dinner, it was almost around dinner, almost always. These greatest intimate times were around dinner. And so God is preparing a feast, and he's preparing a treasure that he is setting apart for his, his own special treasure. He intends for each one of you to be one, a, a jewel in that treasure. 
gathered in these end times. Well, this can go that way and that can go sideways and that can crush down and something else might rise up, but you're fearing the Lord and you're, you're his treasure. You're his special treasure. So with that Issachar anointing in mind, do you remember the Lord was sharing about a river some months ago and since then? In my heart, for sure, since he showed me that. And it was thematic. It's been thematic. And it's not like I cerebrally hang on to it. I don't. He just keeps bringing up the elements. And the main theme was deliverance. Then he brought up an altar, right? It's his altar. And as you were singing today, there's some very poignant songs um, about the foot of the cross, and then it was prophesied about the foot of the cross. And I was thinking about that a lot today, too. And, you know, if you didn't get up and say it, I could have. You know what I mean? And if you didn't get up and say it, you, we, you know, we're singing the same song. Because we're hearing the same voice. And he's saying, you're at the foot of the cross. And it came to me during the worship. You know that? I mean, I'm sure you've heard this. <laughs> I haven't heard it a lot, but it's true. That, that tree that he died on, the Bible called it a tree once, I think. He died on that tree. That tree became a tree of life to us, didn't it? And so the altar that the Lord showed, where we're going to get that deliverance that comes in that river, right? That altar is Christ's altar where he offered himself. It's that cross. It's the foot of that cross that you will find a complete finishing work. And God is doing a finishing work in his people if you don't hear that in a prophetic voice, they may be hearing from God, but why are they missing that? It's important. You need to hear from God because God is right now not all about what's the juiciest and the latest end time. Can you read the newspaper tomorrow? That's not the most important thing. What's going to happen in Germany tomorrow? What's, what's the World Economic Forum going to do tomorrow? What are they planning this week? What did they talk about last month? You could read all day long, but God's saying, I'm planning a bride. I'm calling out a treasure. And right now, they're at the foot of the cross. That's where they are. These people are on their knees and they're on their face because they're being crushed. And they're not being crushed because the economy has failed yet. That's for the world. They're being crushed because they're willingly at the foot of the cross. And they're saying, I'm falling on the rock so that the rock will not fall on me. But that's not my main purpose. I'm falling on the rock because I want him. And so they're falling on the rock. He said, if whoever falls in this rock, I have a promise for you. You'll be broken to pieces. If that's not happening yet, we re you need to get into your closet and find out what's God saying to me that needs to get me broken. You know, you've heard of this, the, 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 the term brokenness, right? Brokenness is one of the greatest gifts of God. You know, there's just something not right if brokenness is not in our lives, at this time especially. You know, Jesus said at one time of his disciples when they said, how come your disciples don't fast? He says, well, they will later. Let me, let me expound on that. He says, we're actually getting ready for something really special, a wedding kind of thing right now, and, and the bridegroom is with everybody right now, and it's just a real great happy time but there's a day very soon when they will be fasting and Peter's actually going to get sifted Satan's actually going to sift Peter really bad right but it's for Peter's good that's where we're at right now God wants to sift us now so that we will be pure and ready for what he wants to he wants to Im Jesus does not want to embellish you like a Christmas tree. I like Christmas trees, by the way. I keep mine up until the thing almost falls over. And then Rose says, I'm taking that down. I said, no, no, another week, you know. But God doesn't want to embellish you like a Christmas tree. I've had a lot of embellishing times, and I hope you have had two precious times of the Lord where you might go for years or weeks or months or maybe just a day where you feel like, oh, I feel so happy. I feel so good in God. Not just like I had a good day, but you just feel it. I did that after last Sunday. I felt that way. It lasted right into the next day, and then it faded away because God is actually crushing me right now. He's not embellishing me with his outer presence, but he visited us with his presence, and I am so thankful for that, every embellishment, every coating. We need all of that, but he's also saying there's something deeper that you need because I need to get you 
absolutely broken so that I can inhabit you in an absolute full way. Not just we, you need another good meeting or you need a revival to keep going or you, you know, you need to, we play worship music for years at home, you know, all day. Like it's running at my house right now. I put a song on a, loop, a bunch of stuff, Paul Wilbur stuff, ran it on a loop. I thought it keeps the, the, the grace of God moving in your house. You walk in my house, you'll know. <laughs> it's how you live, and it's also the atmosphere you fill your house with, right? So we, we need all that outer support, right? But then God goes, how would you do in a crushing day, in an awkward moment, where you don't have your background choir, you don't have, like, you know, I don't have my music, right? I've had some failures lately, you know? I had my grandsons work with me this week, and some really hard work, right? And uh, I got really grumpy. And it was horrible how grumpy I was. And I thought I was done with all that. And, and the Lord revealed it. And because and I have a really serious back issue, right? So I shouldn't even be doing that kind of work. But I was working like I did when I was 23, because I had to, for two whole days, running around, pressure washing with heavy duty pressure washers. And I was like in agony. And you think that doesn't make you feel agitated? Give it a try sometime, you know, and have a bad day, right? And then see how you how Christ-like you can be under that pressure. But think of Jesus when he was dying on the cross. I have never lived up to this yet. He was dying on the cross, and it said he didn't curse, but he, he blessed. Well, he's, like he's being crucified. And he's been through days of, and years, actually, of rejection by those people. And then he asked God to forgive them. And then his biggest concern is, his, not his biggest concern, but one of his great concerns, it's right there, just, just before he's done, he says, hey, John, take care. Of, there's your mother. Take care of my mom. You've just adopted her. <laughs> he's thinking of her, not himself. And he's standing there being crucified naked, and he's thinking of others. And I'm going, wow, that was not exactly on my mind when I was grumpy this week, right? And I'd fail, and then i go, I'm failing, I'm failing. And so here, you know what we're at right now? We're at the foot of that altar, which God spoke of a few months ago. Uh, and, uh, and I realized the Lord was saying, this is gonna, we're going to be here. Remember me saying, we're going to be here for a while because God has to do a thorough work, right? It's called a threshing floor experience in the Bible. There's a number of, of, uh, of times when that's mentioned, many, many times. And one of those times was when Peter was about to be, the, when Jesus was crucified, he, was, he thought he was doing pretty good probably. You would be, I would be if I was Peter and had all the stuff going on that he had going on, right? And he now, oh boy, he had a lot of good stuff going on, I'll tell you. And, and the Lord said, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you. I have prayed for you. So your faith's not going to fail. <laughs> but you're going to fail, obviously. <laughs> I'm going to press you until you fail. Beyond your point of recovery. And you know what? It's in that time that we realize... I can respond to the Lord to a certain measure of correction. You know, we've all been corrected, right? And we can learn and grow. You know, I think everybody here has done a lot of learning and growing, right? There's a point that you can't go. There's a point that you cannot get to. You can't. You can't pray enough. You can't be sincere enough. You can't get there. You want to show, you want to see the two biggest ones in the Bible? There was the Red Sea and the Jordan. No man could cross that sea. No man could part it. Only God could do it. Only God could do it. And we are at a point. The remnant of God, his precious treasure, right now, I'm telling you an Issachar thing to say. We are at the foot of an altar, at the foot of the cross. It's a tree of life. If you allow him to get there, you there and break you there, and not just skip over it and go, well, you know, not much is going on, so I'll just, whatever, you know. Just look a little higher. <laughs> this is the greatest gift that God could ever do for you. He gave you salvation first at the Red Sea. But this greatest now gift that you could possibly get after being born again is to now have yourself broken so that Christ can absolutely possess you because that's what he's doing with his special treasure he wants to absolutely have you with stuff that you were born with 
You go, how come that didn't leave when I was born again? In my theory, in my philosophy, that should have been gone. But every time I get hungry or tired or pressed or really, really pressed, it's there. Then you go, then you develop another doctrine, which probably at least three quarters of the church still has, sadly. Church, may you get rid of this doctrine. Is thinking, well, I guess all those things will just leave when I get a new body. That's not, you could drag that out of some scriptures. It's not hard. But when you see what God is saying in many other places, you realize it's not his intent. He's making a bride ready that has not even a spot or a wrinkle. Not just you're forgiven, but no spots or wrinkles. So he says, I'm going to have to break you. If you fall on the rock, I'll break you. It's a gift. So like yesterday, my grandsons laughed after being there two weeks. They're precious and they're really wonderful to be around. They're, you know, but they're not perfect. Neither am I, right? So your, your space, you're an old guy, you're hurt and you're tired, you know, and you're working together and, and, and really hard work. And now you're pressed. And so now, oh, dear. So they finally, they laughed. And now I got my space back and I just, okay, I'm waiting quietly on the Lord. And I couldn't feel God. I just felt dead. I just felt worn out, burnt out, tired, pain, like through the roof, stretching for hours a day and hot tub and jacuzzi with salt and painkillers, painkillers. And, you know, and, and God, you know, I, I know I'm a wretch, you know. Yeah, you're going good. I'm glad you realize that. <laughs> it's not just on a happy days, you know. Uh, uh, but he, he has a gift in mind. And I had to, like, start to get spiritual again and get past that. And... Uh, I guess I could say all that. Just that's the thematic background. But now what do you do about it? Well, this is what I was doing about it. I'm not there yet, but this is what I'm doing about it. And it's working. I'm not all there. No, not even close. Is, is to go spend hours, like uh, all day. You got a day? Spend all day. Spend it the night. Wake up in the middle of the night. If you, can, if you don't have to get up a certain time in the morning and you wake up, just stay awake and start seeking him. And pleading with him. Don't try and get past this moment. Don't try and get past this stressful moment. Oh, my faults were revealed today or last week. He goes, yeah, what are you going to do about it? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. I know you're sorry. You've been sorry every time for the last million years. But can we get past sorry? I'm really, really sorry. Would you please deliver me of this? And he goes, ah, oh. remember that river? Deliverance. Because here we are. God's getting us to this point of this deliverance, right? <laughs> What a gift to be delivered of yourself, yeah. right? You know, Peter, after he was sifted and the Lord restored him, wow, it was a, a big change. And it wasn't the only change. He was going to have to go through many more changes yet in his life. He even failed again. He got balled out by Paul in front of everybody for big screw up. <laughs> you remember that? Paul had to chastise Peter. Peter, the guy that preached on Pentecost and the whole revival was launched. And then a little while later, year two or three or whatever, Paul's rebuking him for his some hypocrisy and stuff. And he goes, oh, busted, right? You know, God will take us through seasons. And it's called the threshing floor. And a threshing floor was where you take grain. Remember he said Satan wants to thresh you like wheat, Peter. They would... Uh, use different means of, of, of threshing wheat, but one of the most uh, best descriptive ones and probably the most common, they'd have an ox or a, a, a cow or something, but oxen were really strong or great, a lot of endurance. They'd, they'd take this big, like a, like a big sled, like a raft, big raft of wood, and they'd have pieces, I think, of metal on the bottom. And then fleshing floor would probably be made out of stone, and it's really flat. And that ox would pull this big sledge with the metal pieces on the bottom. Think of Jesus being scourged. Well, that was a threshing. Remember? All the pieces of metal on that thing that they scourged Jesus with, right? Right? And so this picture now, this this threshing sledge being pulled by oxen. You've fallen on the rock. The Lord has heard you. And now he's blessing you with a scourge. He's blessing you. 
It's his great blessing because he has a resurrection in morning. In the morning, he has a plan for your morning. It's better than this moment. But he can't get you there into the full resurrection of Christ possessing you unless he can get you fully dead to what you've clung to and has clung to you and probably clung to your ancestors for thousands of years. And he's going, I'm, I got a blessing for you. You're the last generation. You're falling on the rock. You're my precious treasure. I'm going to drive this threshing sledge over you like a scourge until the chaff, that's the, the utter husk of the grain, is broken off. The scripture says, what is the chaff to the wheat? It's a one-off scripture. <laughs> but if you, if you knew this, you go, wow, that, that really means something. What is the chaff to the wheat? Not much after it's gone. It's the painful process when it's getting ripped off of you and you're being scourged. And he says, but when it's all over, I wipe away every tear. And how does he do that? Oh, I give you so much more than what you suffered. What you suffered was so worth it. You didn't earn your redemption, but you came into touch with my redemption because I had to redeem your life and you didn't even know it needed redeeming as deep as it needed. You thought you needed forgiveness from your sins and you did and you got born again. But God has a deeper thing. He goes, you need to be done with yourself, everything of Adam, and I have a new you. I'm going to give you a new name. You know, book of Revelation, Jesus Christ, the overcomers. Seven promises to seven overcomers within a couple chapters, the overcoming company of seven churches. And they'll get things like, I'm going to give you a new stone, a white stone with a new name written on it. You get a new name. I, I'm looking forward to that. I've been asking him for it. Lord, what's my name? Because it has a lot of meaning in it. Please, I want that name. And you also get his new name written on you. He's going to give you a new name that he has in mind. In other words, a greater revelation. God already knows himself. He goes, I have to reinvent myself. No, that's not what he's saying. He goes, I'm going to reveal something more of myself to you that has never been revealed on earth before. Never. Except to these overcomers. I'm going to write my new name on the overcomers. And they will inherit all... I'm, I'm quoting out of the New Testament in the book of Revelation. I'll write on them my, my new name. I'll give them to eat of the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. Like, that's great. He said, you'll rule the nations with a rod of iron. That's going on into the millennium. Read all the scriptures concerning the millennium. There's a lot. <laughs> Somebody's going to be ruling those nations because they're not all pretty little Christians yet. They don't have any devil left on the earth, but they still have a lot of self. And we can even see at the end of the millennium, we see how Satan is allowed out to test them again to see where their hearts are really at when they get the pressure on. But who's their disciplers? Who is going to disciple the nations in the millennium? It's going to be the overcomers. It's going to be the bride. Oh, God has so much in store for you. If you fall on this cross, the foot of this cross, and you'll say, I am crucified with Christ. And you'll be finished with what was weighing you down and always being a weight to the glory and the grace of God, being full in you. That's the glory of the bride. In... Uh, In Micah, there's so many scriptures. I'm not going to bring them all up, but I, there's a lot. But here's one. Micah chapter 4, verse 11 to 13 speak. And don't look it up because I'm just going to be there for a moment. Is, uh, I'm not even going to give you the background story. It's not the important part. The point is God was speaking to the enemies of Israel. And uh, he, God said of these enemies of Israel, he said, they don't know the thoughts of the Lord. Well, they're definitely not Issachar, right? They don't know his thoughts. They don't understand his plan. That he has gathered them as sheaves to the threshing floor. So they were not, they weren't, the, the nations are going to be threshed. But they're not going to come out also pretty out of that. Some will be saved, but a lot of them won't be. Because they won't even understand the purpose of the threshing. 
So that explains a lot of the end times. God is threshing, but a lot of it is tares. But you are wheat. God is not threshing you to destroy you. He's threshing you to free you. And you know the most, one of the most precious stories in the Bible of the threshing floor is in Ruth, where I think it was her mother-in-law said, well, this rich kinsman redeemer, Boaz, you know, the kinsman redeemer story that's behind that, who is Christ, really. So Boaz was a prophetic, typological Christ, you know, a, a metaphor of Christ, right? Like Isaac was to Abraham, right? And, but more so of Christ as the redeemer, but also as Christ as the groom. So when she was told, okay, you really, he's got eyes for you and you know it. Go offer yourself to him in marriage. Just touch toes. He's sleeping in the threshing floor. The bride came to him in the threshing floor. That's where during the season of harvest, I read this in a little research. During the season of harvest, the landowners and their families were all involved in that harvest. They would stay amongst the harvest and often sleep in the threshing floor all the season of harvest. Where are you going to be finding your groom right now? Where is he going to be for the next how many years? The season of harvest. He will especially be there for you at the threshing floor. And she willingly came to him there. And it wasn't a bad experience. It was just went straight from there to marriage, to full measure of redemption unto marriage. And that's what God has intended for you. So come to him in your closet and it takes hours. You can't, this is not the prayer like you pray for somebody and you pray for them and you pray for five minutes or five times a day, maybe. This is a place where you just come to it. And you're, you're pleading with him, God, I'm at the edge of the Jordan. I'm ready to cross into the promise that you've had intended. You gave me the crossing of the Red Sea for this purpose, to get to this point. And now there's another river in front of me. Another absolute impasse. I cannot save myself. If you show me all my faults right now, all I can do is lament them. And he goes, that's a good start. I don't want you to just skip over this and go, God, I got some faults. Could we get past this and you forgive me? Because I, and he goes, no, you're not getting past this. You need to confess. You need to understand the depths of your own depravity the depths to which you actually have resisted me your whole life and all your kinfolk and all your ancestors. The, your kinfolk are in this threshing floor all the season of harvest. They should be. And, and let him, he doesn't want to berate you. He doesn't want to abuse you. He's a loving groom. He wants to free you. That's the purpose. So he's calling you here and he's going to reveal to you how much you need to be saved yet. Not just forgiven, saved. And as scripture says, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to him. That's his intention, to absolutely free us absolute so that Christ will absolutely possess us and in the tribulation we will be harvesters we will not be shaken we will be the ones immovable as a special treasure when everything else is shaking we're unshakable because he actually is not just gonna shake you to show you right now how much you need to be saved more yet fully full salvation. He's going to shake you so that you go, you can get through this as quick as possible. He doesn't want this to go on forever. Although the tribulation will not be a, a little dance in the park. 
but it'll be a lot better for the bride, and it will be a lot shorter period, as far as I can tell by reading the Bible, right? There'll be a lot of shelter, and the, the primary shelter is Psalm 91. It's not Psalm 91. Oh, I got a magical Psalm. No! I've heard so many people say, Psalm 91. I go, what was that? I forget. You know? So it's not Psalm 91. It's what's in Psalm 91. Under the shadow of the Most High. That close. Peter's shadow. Remember Peter's shadow? After he went through his threshing floor and the Lord restored him, Peter's shadow healed the sick. You want to be under the shadow of the Most High? Have you ever heard it said this? Whatever overshadows you, you overshadow. So if God is overshadowing you, in your shadow is his presence. Do you want to bring redemption and salvation to the people of the world? That's his intention. So come to him. Know that there is life here. And then when you actually get to the foot of this cross and you're really broken, he goes, and you really, really see, you've been spending hours and days and probably weeks, maybe months, <laughs> confessing your faults, your sins, and asking God, take me deeper. Not just like saying the same thing over and over. It's not like repetitious. No, he wants you to get past the repetition. He wants you to see what is your depravity. What are the roots of it? And, and then when you see it, then you can confess it, and then you can actually disassociate yourself from it in a sense. You, you associate with it. It's like, that is my sin. But you can actually disassociate. You go, I absolutely realize that, and I'm not going to live forward from this day on with a facade about myself. He goes, I'll deliver you from that. And as soon as their feet of the priests touch the water, Carrying the ark at the Jordan, the waters parted. And they parted, and the waters were moved all the way back, far away, to a town called Adam. You don't think that's a prophecy? That, that was a prophecy. And then when they crossed, one of the first experiences they had, they all, all the men that hadn't been circumcised, I guess that hadn't happened in the wilderness, they hadn't been doing that, they, they got circumcised. Which again, so rolling of the waters back. And he said at Gilgal, there he, because the word Gilgal came to mean rolling away, reproach. When he rolls the curse of Adam off of you, of all your ancestors, of all your ingrown iniquity, he rolls away the reproach. You're not just forgiven, you're changed. And, and so they were, they had their, it's, it's crude, you know, but they had their skin rolled away, cut off, rolled away. And their reproach was rolled away. And the water was rolled away. It's a prophetic thing. And then they fought for seven years to fully possess the inheritance. And they walked in as conquerors, overcomers. So possibly that is a metaphor also or a, a similarity to the seven years that the tribulation possibly lasts. I'm not saying it is, but possibly there. So as for me and hopefully my whole house, we're falling on that rock until the rock is finished with falling. Well, it won't have to fall on us. He says if, if, you, if, you, uh, if, if you don't fall on the rock, the rock will fall on you and grind you to powder. And that's what's happening to all the stubborn, the proud, the religious, and the nations. It will fall on religion. It will fall on church. Rock will fall on everybody. And everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But if you are already dealt with at this rock, you will be unshakable. And you will be one of the sons of Zion that God will actually provide as a deliverer. You will actually be a deliverer rather than one that needs deliverance. For you will embody the deliverance of the deliverer. You will embody his salvation. You will be like Peter, who became the message, so that the shadow of Peter was the shadow of Christ.
was talking, I was, I know he didn't, he wanted to get into the baptism of fire, but the promise in, in Matthew 3, 12, when he talks about the threshing floor, whose winnowing, winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and he will gather his wheat into the barn. So after the threshing, he gathers us into one, into, into an upper room. That's what it's talking about here. See, when the Lord can, the Lord can get at the, the chaff in us, He gathers us together. And then, and in that place, in the barn, He will burn up the chaff. The chaff is all the things He was talking about. The, the self that we cannot, we can't pray out, we can't cry out. We just wait, and then He brings the fire. He burns up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Our God is a consuming fire. Jesus promised a baptism of fire. And he says, I'm coming to bring a, bap a second baptism, a baptism of fire. And how I wish it were already kindled. But it's in that posture of the upper room, one accord, hungry, desperate, longing for the person it's those people he visits with fire and it's his fire his fire is a purifying fire it's an enabling fire and i i've you know we've been talking about that for a while the lord the lord is coming with a new fire oh and it's not long in coming <laughs> but lord we as a people so lord we repent where we have not we have not met you at the threshing floor. We've avoided the threshing floor. We've danced around the threshing floor. We've Netflixed our way out of the threshing floor. But God, we, again, we come with a new resolve. And God, we ask us, you would help us today. You would help us meet you like Ruth did in the threshing floor. And that you would have your way in us, God, completely. And that you would give us the courage to face that cross mm. in our lives, Lord. And it, Lord, in any areas where, you know, it says in the lake of fire will be filled with cowards. The Lord's looking for courage today to face, to face him. And, and to not be afraid of what might be you know what me you know the, the the exposure of ourself is 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 a painful thing but if you're a coward you're going to run away so lord i ask even now lord we ask for courage to stand to to remain at that altar until you have your complete work with us lord and lord we just even pray for those who are supposed to be at that altar and the enemy has thwarted them and distracted them and detour, detoured and I've been I want for one have been detoured by by the enemy so many times it, only to yet to come back to the threshing floor the Lord there waiting for me the whole time I'm glad you came back <laughs> I couldn't meet you anywhere else but here you are at the threshing floor you weren't you I, I looked for you in other places and you're right there at the thresh that place of lowliness that place of brokenness so Lord, we as a people, Lord, we, we come again to that place, that lowly place. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, God, where if we've been distracted. Forgive us of being cowardly, of running in other every other direction but where you are. And and um, Lord, we want to be where you are. And Lord, I my heart and, and I just pray for those, Lord, that have become exasperated, perhaps, have run away, but they they, you're calling them back. And I just pray right now, Lord, that the sound of the Lord, the trumpet of the Lord would go forth even now to those who have been discouraged from the threshing and, and or they may have lost sight of your kindness in it. They lost sight of your love in it, Lord. Because you promised that those who you began again a good work in, that you would complete it. So yes. Lord, we pray for those in our lives, Lord, that you're beckoning them to come. 
to come back to that place of transformation, to the place of meeting you, of being delivered, to come to Bethel and wrestle that our flesh would be pinned down to the ground by you. Oh God, we pray you would have your way today. God, we pray for those who have left, those who have been sucked away. Lord, we pray that them that they would come back. They would come back, Lord. That you would have a complete work in us. Lord, that you would have a bride made ready in Canada. Lord, we just pray, Lord, we just pray for your church at large, God. Lord, may the trumpet sound. Trumpet, Lord. Let's all stand up. If somebody's watching online and you, you want to really feel like you're part of what God's doing. This is not just something he's doing in this little group here. It's This is body-wide. You may not hear these words everywhere, but you know that these are his words. This is thematic. Know that this is what the Lord is doing doing many things but he has the core of his heart we want to be about that so the blowing of the trumpets was for many things and I want you online and here to join in this burden of the Lord and the release of this sound and the gathering together unto the sound of the trumpet of the Lord because the trumpet is used to gather it's used to alarm it's used to announce and so father pray this with me father let the sound of your word your trumpet your burden be released to your bride to your remnant people they may be about your business until you come amen together to his voice all you who profess to know Christ in this day are you gathering unto his voice turn off the other voices you need to be hearing his voice and you need to not just hear his voice through a myriad of voices you need to know his voice We ask, Father, that it would be a voice, one voice. Silence the false voices and that there would be one voice rising above all other voices in this time. And Lord, we ask that that voice would be accompanied with signs and wonders. Lord, we ask that you again would raise up the call, the call to your bride to come forth. 
And God, we ask for Canada, that you would have a bride. In this hour, in this time of preparation for the harvest that's coming, the harvest, the time of the harvest, the threshing floor is in the time of the harvest. We know the harvest is at hand. It's close at hand. God, we ask that you would harvest the harvesters, that you would prepare a people even now, even here, God, that you would make us ready, that you would make us safe for your harvest to come in. And start with us, God. Start with our hearts. Have your way today, Lord. Any crooked way, Lord, again, we ask. We invite your fire. We invite your holy searchlight to come. Come into our homes. Come into our marriages. Come into every relationship. God, expose that which is not pleasing to you. Lord, that you would fit, we make us a habitation in the spirit. Your desire, which has always been from time before time, that you would have a people that you could dwell in and among in a full measure. A people that want you, a people that are after your heart, God. Lord, we ask, again, I ask, release the spirit of prayer and supplication upon this body. Lord, I pray for the spirit of revival and the spirit of intercession. The spirit of, that we would tell oh, that our eyes would not be dry. Lord, that our hearts would burn with what burns on your heart. That would burn on your heart with, on the cross. That burn on your heart when you sent your son to earth to become a man. And you are a man. You stayed a man forever. Lord, you became, you came in our, in, in, in our likeness to have a bride. So, Lord, that you would have us become in your likeness now. That we would do you the favor. You became a man and stayed a man forever. Lord, we would become a bride in your heavenly likeness, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that that work would be... Lord, we ask for a fresh outpouring of your spirit. A fresh expectation even now, Lord. Lord, we've become so weary of believing and in the season of waiting... Lord, that we have become, Lord, forgive us where we've stopped believing and stopped asking. And Lord, today I ask for a fresh impartation of faith to begin to ask, to begin to expect breakthrough. Lord, we've just, you know, like prisoners, slaves that have been slaves for so long, they don't even know what, they've given up what even freedom is. Lord, I pray that you would awaken hope again today where there's no hope. Oh, Jesus.